Testing, one, two, three, testing, one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon Sunday School on the air. Yes, Radio Free Mormon Sunday School, where you're going to learn things you're never going to hear about in regular Sunday School. Now, I've got to tell you something about my shirt. I have been wearing a blue shirt or a patterned shirt for all of these Sunday School lessons, and I realize that is not the standard Mormon uniform. I'm supposed to have a white shirt on to teach Sunday School. Well, I don't have any white shirts right now, hence I haven't been wearing any, but cognizant of my duties and responsibilities in this regard, I have ordered a white shirt. I ordered a white shirt a number of days ago. It came in the mail and it was the wrong size. It was not the size I had ordered. It would not fit me. So I had to send it back, try and get the right size. Well, it came back yesterday on the front doorstep. Now I've got the right size. I bring it down to the studio this morning and I open it up, I take it out of its wrapper and you'll notice I'm not wearing it, I'm wearing a blue shirt, but there's a reason for this. Let me show you what the reason for this is. Here is the very shirt that I opened today to get ready to put on the show. And where is this? Oh, there it is. Yeah, that's right there on the front. Can you see that? Can I hold, hold it up real close? Yeah, you can see that, can't you? Right on the front where you'd be able to see it, even with my jacket on. So it appears that some power somewhere doesn't want me to be wearing a white shirt on this show. I'll give it another go. And if you ever see me wearing a white shirt on this show, you'll know that it worked. But once again, we are here for Radio Free Mormon Sunday School. It's lesson number nine. It's in the Come Follow Me manual. It's from the Book of Mormon, which is 2 Nephi 11 through 19 is the material for today's lesson and uh, it is lesson number nine it's from february 26th through march 3rd okay so let's start going through these slides because this is going to be very interesting by the way the name of the show today is why is the book of mormon so boring well some people like the book of mormon more than others uh, mark twain thought that it was chloroform in print but the hardest thing to get through, even for people who like the Book of Mormon, is the Isaiah chapters in 2 Nephi. And that's where we are this week. It's also where we're going to be next week. They've split it up because there's an awful lot of Isaiah that's going to be quoted by Nephi in 2 Nephi. So let's go to the first slide. All right. Let's look at the 20,000 foot view of 2 Nephi 11 through 33. This is Nephi's last sermon, and it is a doozy. It's the longest sermon in the Book of Mormon because it really does comprise all of the chapters from chapter 11 of 2 Nephi all the way to 33, which is the end of the book. So let's look at the structure of this sermon of Nephi, this long sermon. Uh, but first, in order to do that, let's recap the structure of Jacob's sermon that we covered last week. Why? Because we are going to find out that Nephi's sermon is structured quite similarly to Jacob's sermon. So if we compare the sermons of Jacob and Nephi over here on one side of the screen, Jacob's sermon structure is that Jacob quotes entire chapters of Isaiah, a little more than two full chapters for Jacob, and then sermonizes about it, likening what Isaiah said to himself, to his people, and to several other subjects, as we covered last week. Now, Nephi's sermon structure you'll see is quite similar. First, Nephi quotes entire chapters of Isaiah, just like his brother, but he quotes 13 of them and then sermonizes about it for a number of chapters. Nephi then gives a longer sermon than Jacob. He quotes more Isaiah and he gives a longer sermon than Jacob. It's as if Nephi saw what Jacob did and then decided to do the same basic thing, only bigger. Nephi will incorporate Isaiah into his sermon and also elements of his own vision that he received in 1 Nephi chapters 11 through 14. We'll get to that later. Right now, we're stuck in Isaiah 4 this week, but we're going to have a lot of fun talking about it. So the substance of Nephi's sermon, what Nephi appears to be doing is taking some elements of Isaiah's prophecies, mixing in elements of his own vision from 1 Nephi 11 through 14, and creating a much larger and more comprehensive and expansive prophecy of the future. Nephi hits the same basic elements that Jacob hits in his sermon. 
One, the Jews will return from Babylon to Jerusalem. Two, Jesus will come in his earthly ministry and be rejected and crucified. Three, Jews will be scattered again for rejecting Jesus. Four, in the last days, the Jews will be gathered again to Jerusalem. When they begin to believe in Jesus, those two things are linked together. The idea that the Jews will begin to believe in Jesus, and that will happen at the same time, and perhaps even precipitate their return to Jerusalem. I'm not sure that that's happened since 1947. Number five, the last one, Jesus will come a second time to overthrow the wicked and establish his kingdom of faithful saints. So once again, Nephi is very similar to Jacob, just bigger. Yeah, anything you can do, I can do better. That's what Nephi seems to be saying to his brother Jacob. When it comes to the two sermons, Nephi just does it all bigger. Is it because he sees what Jacob did and likes it? So he decides to try and beat Jacob by doing it all over again on a bigger scale as a matter of sibling rivalry? Well, I don't know. All I can say is that Nephi's Isaiah and sermon goes from 2 Nephi 11 through 33, and Jacob's only goes from 2 Nephi 6 through 10. So Jacob's total for quoting Isaiah and sermonizing is five chapters. Nephi's total is 23 chapters, more than four times as many chapters as his brother Jacob. So much for the 20,000 foot view. Let's descend now and start inspecting things a little more closely, shall we? The reason it is helpful to look at Nephi's sermon in its entirety is we are able to see things we might miss if we broke it up into four lessons and then took an entire month to cover the whole thing, one lesson each week for an entire month, which is exactly, by the way, <clears throat> what the Come Follow Me manual does. Nephi's sermon in 2 Nephi 11 through 33 will be covered in four different lessons. The first lesson covers just the Isaiah chapters and not even all of those. 2 Nephi 12 through 24 replicates Isaiah 2 through 14. And today the reading material is only 2 Nephi 11 through 19. So there will still be five more chapters of Isaiah we are not covering in this lesson and which will be left over to cover in the next lesson. So let's ask some questions now. What Isaiah does Nephi quote? And by that I mean original Isaiah, Deutero Isaiah, or Trito Isaiah. We talked last time about how Jacob quotes Isaiah 50 and 51, how this is from Deutero Isaiah, which was not even written until after Lehi and his family left Jerusalem around 600 BCE. Nephi, on the other hand, is quoting Isaiah 2 through 14, which is from the original Isaiah. That's what scholars agree on. This is from the original Isaiah. So, Isaiah, having lived around 700 BCE, the good news is that theoretically, at least, the Isaiah quoted by Nephi could have been on the brass plates because it had been written by that point in history. The bad news is, i.e. 600 BC, when they leave with the brass plates, the bad news is it's still a virtual word-for-word -word copy of Isaiah 2 through 14 from the King James Version, which makes no sense if this were in fact a translation as it is represented as being. Because if it were a translation, it would replicate the same ideas, but would not be word for word King James Version as it is. Now Nephi is gonna quote Isaiah 29 as well. He's gonna sneak in another chapter in the middle of his sermonizing. Nephi will quote Isaiah 29 in the middle of his sermonizing in 2 Nephi 27. That's where he quotes Isaiah 29. Isaiah 29, <clears throat> excuse me, is significant to Latter-day Saints because it speaks of the sealed book that one who is learned cannot read. So it is given to the one who is unlearned. You know the prophecy. But 2 Nephi 27 is not a word-for-word -word copy of Isaiah 29. The Book of Mormon reworks Isaiah 29 in an apparent effort to make it match better with Martin Harris's description of his 1828 encounter with Charles Anton in New York City. We will go into that in more detail in a couple of weeks when we get to that chapter. Just want to let you know it's coming up. Now, Nephi does not need all of the Isaiah he quotes. 
for his sermon. At the most, Nephi uses maybe 10%, and I think I'm being generous there, 10% tops of the 13 chapters of Isaiah he quotes in his sermon. A better argument can be made for Jacob's use of Isaiah, which I did last week, and he incorporates substantially in his sermon the Isaiah that he quotes. And we talked about that, both ideas and as well as language and phrasing. Also, whereas Jacob's use of the two Isaiah chapters he quotes is there in the Book of Mormon text, with Nephi, though there are some connections between the Isaiah he quotes and what he teaches, this huge block of Isaiah seems completely unnecessary to copy over into the gold plates in order to make his point. In other words, it distinctly looks like a bunch of filler material that is easier for Joseph Smith to dictate from his copy of the Bible than it would be for Nephi to actually create the plates of gold and inscribe it. And the manual, the Come Follow Me manual, actually makes this point. This is what it says. Engraving on metal plates is not easy, and space on Nephi's small plates was limited. So why would Nephi make the effort of copying so many of the writings of the prophet Isaiah into his record? He did it, this is the manual, asking the question and then answering its own question. He did it because he wanted us to believe in Jesus Christ, period, end of quote from the manual, to which I asked the question, if that is true, why does Nephi copy pages and pages of Isaiah that have literally nothing to do with Jesus Christ. There's a couple of passages in these 13 chapters that could arguably be related to Jesus Christ, but that is a distinct minority. That's 10% or less of the total Isaiah used. So the Book of Mormon usage of Isaiah versus its use of the Book of Revelation. All right? All of these Isaiah chapters are especially strange when we know, as we do, especially if you've been following this class, because we already covered this in 1 Nephi, especially strange when we know that an angel earlier told Nephi not to write any more of his vision. Remember back in 1 Nephi 14? Why? Because that was going to be written by John the Revelator 600 years in the future. You remember the passage, don't you? Nephi says, I was going to write the rest of this vision, but I was told by the angel not to because this guy named John is going to write it. It's given to him to write it, which raises another question. But how are Nephi's people? Remember, this is a record that he's making, not only for the future, but also for his people in that day. But how are Nephi's people going to know what John the Revelator is going to write when it hasn't been written yet? In other words, Nephi's not writing it down because it's given to John to write 600 years in the future. So how are his people, Nephi's people who are reading this record, ever going to know the end of the story, the part that was given to John to write? How does this help the contemporary, Nephi's contemporary, readers of the gold plates? And on top of that, if Nephi doesn't have to write the rest of his vision because another Bible author will be writing it, John the Revelator, why does Nephi have to copy off all of this Isaiah when he knows that all of Isaiah's writings will be available in the last days when the Book of Mormon comes off the press, just like the Book of Revelation? As I read these Isaiah chapters, there may be a place or two that Joseph Smith and other Christians of his day and ours see Isaiah as prophesying of Jesus Christ. But 13 chapters of back-to-back -back Isaiah? Really? This seems a bit much. Now, understanding Isaiah. Let me just state here that uh, Mormons have an interesting position relating to Isaiah. On the one hand, they know, because the Book of Mormon says so, that greater the writings of Isaiah, that he is the most significant and important prophet, and we need to learn and understand his writings. That's one side of the equation. On the, end, um, excuse me, on the other side of the equation is the fact that Mormons can't stand Isaiah because they can't read him. They find him too boring. And that is why the Book of Mormon is so boring, especially here and especially in this lesson and especially in this section of the Book of Mormon where we're talking about the Isaiah chapters in 2 Nephi. Even people 
who find the Book of Mormon interesting will often get hung up in the Isaiah chapters. And I was just talking to a friend of mine earlier today who said that he made it a regular practice as he was reading through the Book of Mormon. He would just skip it, you know, because you can get bogged right down in those Isaiah chapters, put the book aside and never continue beyond that. He found it easier just to read up to the Isaiah chapters, skip them entirely, and then continue reading after the Isaiah is done being quoted. And I doubt that my friend is the only person who does that. Okay, but back in the 1980s, I did some work in studying and learning how to understand Isaiah because I knew it was important and I thought I'd make some effort, give it the old college try, so to speak. So there's the duality I'm talking about. Oh, I said, if the Book of Mormon is chloroform in print, then the Isaiah chapters are cyanide. And my big breakthrough came with a book that was written by Dwayne S. Crowther. There's a picture of him on the right. And that book was How to Understand the Book of Isaiah. And he had four basic principles. You can break down Isaiah's writings into four main categories. And this helped me understand and categorize different parts of Isaiah so that I could understand it better, or at least I felt I was understanding it better. Number one, first category, writings pertaining to Isaiah's day. It's good to learn a little about the history in order to understand what Isaiah is writing about. Number two, prophecies of Jesus coming in the meridian of time. By the way, it just occurred to me the other day, this meridian of time thing. I've often wondered with others how Jesus could be born in the meridian of time when there's 4,000 years, at least going conservatively, 4,000 years before him and there's 2,000 years after him before he comes again. Well, we're, st we're, we're still waiting for that. But you know, April 8th is, is coming up with that eclipse that's going to complete the cross across the United States. Today's date is February 24th, 2024. So we got a couple of more months before a lot of people are going to uh, believe that Jesus is going to come again on that time. So what I'm saying is, is that how is it the meridian of time? Because we think of meridian, or I did think of meridian as being the center point. There's way too much time before Jesus comes compared to how much time after he came for that to be the center point. It occurred to me just as I was preparing this, that that's probably not what meridian of time means. The meridian of time is the demarcation between BC and AD, or in today's terms, between BCE and CE. In other words, everything before Jesus is negative numbers. Everything after Jesus is positive numbers. He is the meridian of time. We base all time off of his birth. So I think maybe that's what it's referring to as the meridian of time. Anyway, getting back to Dwayne Crowther's approach. Two, prophecies of Jesus coming in the meridian of time. Three, prophecies of the restoration of the gospel in the latter days. And four, prophecies of the second coming of Christ. Now, this was very helpful to me at the time, but after lots more study and investigation in the intervening decades, I have come to understand that he was right but only in one of his categories. The first, the writings in Isaiah about Isaiah's day and how studying what was going on in Isaiah's day and learning a little bit about the history can be very helpful in understanding what the heck it is that Isaiah is talking about. Isaiah, according to the vast majority of scholars, Isaiah had nothing to say about Jesus coming in mortality or his second coming, and likewise, nothing to say about the restoration of the gospel. Now, there are messianic prophecies in Isaiah, but they do not envision Jesus of Nazareth. These are all interpretations that have been placed on Isaiah's writings after the fact by people who do believe in these things and want to prove their truth by showing ancient prophets like Isaiah saw it coming. This is not a new phenomenon, and it's not restricted just to the Latter-day Saints. Pretty much all Christians do this. Many Christian religions do exactly this sort of proof texting. Jehovah's Witnesses are sure, for example, that their name was prophesied by a passage from Isaiah, coincidentally. It's Isaiah 43, 10. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord. And that is, of course, the Tetragrammaton, which stands for Yahweh or Jehovah. You, ye are my witnesses, Jehovah, Jehovah, Jehovah. Ye are my witnesses, saith Jehovah. And that's where they get their name, Jehovah's Witnesses. So they see that as well as applying to them. We're not the only ones who do it. 
the Jehovah's Witnesses do it as well. We also find it in the New Test, excuse me, in the New Testament. <clears throat> With Matthew leading the pack of authors searching the Hebrew scriptures or the Old Testament in order to find prophecies that found their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Joseph Smith appears to have done the same thing, finding Bible passages he thought predicted him and the restoration. We have already seen how Joseph Smith seems to have used Jacob's patriarchal blessing on Joseph from Genesis chapter 49 to predict the broken branch of the Nephites that crossed the waters. Remember, they're descendants of Joseph. We will see in a few weeks how Joseph Smith does the same thing with Isaiah 29. So Old Testament prophecies of Jesus Christ. Matthew and other New Testament authors competed to find Old Testament prophecies that Christ fulfilled. This was picked up by most Christian denominations thereafter, accepting that these Old Testament scriptures actually do prophecy or prophesy, excuse me, of Jesus Christ. The thinking seems to be that if the New Testament says the Old Testament prophesied of Christ and the New Testament is scripture, then it must be true. Mormons have joined the Christian world in this belief, and here it shows up in the Book of Mormon. Another quote from the Come Follow Me manual. Because Isaiah used symbolic language, it can be easy to overlook his powerful witness of Jesus Christ, which raises the question in my mind, if Isaiah's witness of Jesus Christ is so powerful, how can it be easy to overlook? Let's look at an example, shall we? First off, we're going to go to 2 Nephi 11. This is the beginning of the reading assignment for this week. Christ is God in the Book of Mormon. Remember, this is the introductions that Nephi's given, giving to his quotations of Isaiah. Christ is God in the Book of Mormon. This fact is made clear in numerous places. Some of them were changed in subsequent editions, but none more clearly than in Nephi's introduction to his sermon found in 2 Nephi 11, the introduction that is, 2 Nephi 11, 6 and 7. And my soul delighteth in proving unto my people that save Christ should come, all men must perish. For if there be no Christ, there be no God. Now, I have struggled with that a number of times, and only recently have I allowed myself to see the fact that Christ is God in the Book of Mormon. So therefore, if we see Christ as God, not as the Son of God, a separate individual, as Mormonism came to believe over time, but if Christ is God, then obviously it's axiomatic that if there be no Christ, there be no God, because Christ is God. So if there isn't a Christ, there isn't a God. He goes on, and if there be no God, we are not, for there could have been no creation. But there is a God, and he is Christ. There he makes the connection clear. And he cometh in the fullness of his own time. So Christ is God in the Book of Mormon, and it's clear here in this passage from 2 Nephi chapter 11. Three witnesses. Nephi thinks it's important that there be multiple witnesses of Jesus Christ, multiple people who have seen him and who bear testimony of the fact that they have seen him. This is in chapter 11, verse 3, a little bit earlier in that same chapter. And my brother Jacob, Nephi speaking, also has seen him as I have seen him. So there's two witnesses. Wherefore, I will send their words forth unto my children to prove unto them that my words are true. Wherefore, by the words of three, God hath said, I will establish my word. Nevertheless, God sendeth more witnesses, and he proveth all his words. When he's talking about sending their words, I think he's talking about Jacob and Isaiah's, because Isaiah is the third witness. And actually, part of that is quoted in this 13-chapter uh, uh, segment of Isaiah. We'll get to that. Oh, we'll get to it right now. Nephi, however, needs only one verse from Isaiah to make his point, and that's in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, quoted in 2 Nephi 16, verse 1, and it goes like this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, 
and his train filled the temple, period, end of quote. Nephi doesn't need 13 chapters of Isaiah to make his point, just one verse. This highlights how much Isaiah, Nephi quotes, that really serves no purpose to his sermon, which again makes one wonder why he went to all the trouble to create the plates, no small feat, and engrave them, especially in light of how difficult he tells us the process is. Now, in Isaiah, there is a famous prophecy of Jesus. At least the Christian world typically looks at this as a very famous prophecy of Jesus. And it starts in 2 Nephi 17, verse 10, which, which is Isaiah 7, 10 being quoted here. And here's how it goes. This will sound very familiar to you, I know. It gets quoted a lot. Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz. Now, Ahaz is the king of Jerusalem and the king of Judah at the time, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depths or in the heights above. Any sign you want, pick a card, any card. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David. Is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will ye weary my God also? And I think that's God speaking there. He said, therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and shall bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat that he may know to refuse the evil and to choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good. This is important, by the way. The land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings, of both her kings. What does that mean? What two kings? All right. Isaiah spends nine verses before this prophecy in this chapter and nine verses after this prophecy in this chapter describing a war that was going on between the southern kingdom, Judah, where Isaiah lived in Jerusalem, and the northern kingdom of Israel. Israel had joined forces with the second kingdom, Syria, not Assyria, Syria, to fight against Judah. It is the two kings of Israel and Syria that are referred to here by this prophecy of Isaiah living in the southern kingdom that they're fighting against. So a child shall be born as a sign to King Ahaz, and the sign is that what Isaiah is prophesying about regarding these two kingdoms and that they will end up being destroyed and that Judah will be victorious. This is a sign that that's true and that really is from God. So that's why Isaiah is asking King Ahaz, ask for a sign and God will show it to you to prove that my prophecy is correct. Okay, so a child shall be born is assigned to King Ahaz. And before the child is old enough to know good from evil, both those things, both those kings, excuse me, will be gone. Now, this can't apply to Jesus. When you look at it in context, first off, how is Jesus being born <clears throat> over 500 years in the future after King Ahaz has died? How is that going to be assigned to King Ahaz about the truthfulness of Isaiah's vision? It makes no sense. And also, this child is not going to be old enough to know good from evil before both those kings of Syria and Israel will be taken away and forsaken. That doesn't sound like it applies to Jesus either. Which again raises the question of why include all the surplusage material about the war? Remember the nine verses before and the nine verses after? Why include all that surplusage material about the war if all Nephi is going to use is this prophecy about Jesus? Once again, getting into this idea of why are you quoting all this Isaiah, Nephi? It seems like a lot of trouble for really, for nothing. The prophecy is fulfilled. <clears throat> Not only is that prophecy put in Isaiah, but in the next chapter of Isaiah is recorded the fulfillment of that prophecy, and it's not Jesus. No, it happens in Isaiah's lifetime. It's actually Isaiah's son that's being prophesied. And this is in 2 Nephi 18.1, which is quoting Isaiah 8.1. 1. 
Moreover, excuse me, I'm going to get a little Diet Coke here. <clears throat> excuse me. Moreover, the word of the Lord said unto me, take thee a great roll, that's a scroll, and write in it with a man's pen concerning Maher Shalal Hashbaz, favorite name in the entire Bible. I think it's the longest name in the entire Bible, and this happens to be the name of Isaiah's son. And I took unto me faithful witnesses to record Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jeberechiah. And I went unto the prophetess, to whom he was probably married, Isaiah. And she conceived and bare a son. Then said the Lord to me, call his name Maher Shalal Hashbaz. For behold, the child shall not have knowledge to cry my father and my mother before the riches of Damascus, that's the capital of Syria, and the spoil of Samaria, which is the capital of Israel, shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. And that's when he comes down, the Assyrian Empire comes down and destroys the northern kingdom of Israel, uh, but does not succeed in destroying the southern kingdom of Judah, which remains intact for a little over 100 years until the Neo-Babylonian Empire finally comes in and takes them into captivity. That they are saved for that time period anyway. Judah is. Now, notice this. This prophecy of Jesus, it links it up. Verse 16 of Isaiah 7, For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. So before the child is old enough to know good from evil. So this is going to happen pretty soon. The child's got to be conceived. The child's got to be born. The child's got to grow up to a few years before the child can know good from evil. But by the time that happens, Syria and Israel, their history. And in the fulfillment section of this, in Isaiah 8, verse 4, it links back to that idea. For behold, the child shall not have knowledge to cry, my father and my mother. The child will be so small, he won't even be able to say mommy or daddy before the riches of Damascus. And once again, that's the capital of Syria. Frequently, countries were referred to by their capital. And the spoil of Samaria, Samaria being the capital of Israel, shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. So it is really clear that this is the fulfillment of the prophecy that was given just in the immediately preceding chapter. And now Isaiah is going to make it even more clear later on in Isaiah 8, 18. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are what? They're for signs. What did he say to Ahaz? Ask for a sign. This is a sign the Lord will give you. Me and my children are the signs. And for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. So Isaiah could not make it even more clear. It is a, uh, a matter of the utmost chutzpah for Matthew and others to take this prophecy in Isaiah 7 and apply it to Jesus Christ when it is clear from Isaiah 7 and 8 that it doesn't have anything to do with Jesus Christ. And yet that interpretation continues, and I don't expect it's ever going to stop. So this prophecy ends up becoming applied to Jesus. How did this prophecy from Isaiah, which clearly has nothing to do with the birth of Jesus Christ, come to be so firmly associated with that very thing? It's because of Matthew. And Matthew chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, quote, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So he quotes from Isaiah chapter 7 and applies it to Jesus. And the Christian world has simply followed suit ever since. Now, this whole issue of the virgin is interesting because in Matthew's mind, he's talking about a virgin. It's Mary, and virgin means a person who has never had sexual intercourse with another man, at least if it's a woman. It's flipped if it's a guy, right? A guy who hasn't had sexual intercourse with a woman. That's what a virgin is, and that's the sense in which Matthew's using it. The Gospel of Matthew 
presents Jesus' ministry as largely the fulfillment of prophecies from Isaiah. But in the time of Jesus, the Israelite Jews no longer spoke Hebrew. This is actually going to be important. And Isaiah had to be translated into Greek and Aramaic, the two commonly used languages that the Jews spoke at the time. All right. Now, the Greek translation of Isaiah, the Septuagint, translated the word Alma. Let me just back up a second. In Hebrew, Isaiah talks about an Alma shall conceive. An Alma shall conceive. It's a Hebrew word, and that word means a young woman of childbearing age who had not yet given birth. Okay? It doesn't mean that this woman has never had sexual relations before. It simply means that she's a young woman of childbearing age who has not given birth yet. You can see those are different things. But this was translated from the Hebrew into the Greek two or 300 years before Jesus into the Septuagint. And when the translators took that Hebrew word Alma and translated into Greek, they used the term Parthenos, that's the Greek word they use for Alma. And Parthenos in Greek does mean virgin. So when Matthew is quoting from the Old Testament, he's quoting from the Septuagint, the Greek version, which has suddenly changed the meaning of this word from Alma in Hebrew and that meaning to Parthenos in Greek and that meaning. So Matthew's reading the Old Testament and seeing it talking about a real virgin. This gave the author of Matthew the opportunity to interpret Jesus as the fulfillment of prophecy. He makes Jesus Emmanuel, God is with us, the divine representative on earth, and underlines Jesus' status as son of God by asserting that Joseph did not have sexual intercourse with Mary before she gave birth. Now, second Isaiah, this is the second, excuse me, not second Isaiah, but in this lesson, this is the second Isaiah prophecy of Jesus, or better put, the second prophecy of Jesus in Isaiah. And this gets quoted as well in the Book of Mormon. It's 2 Nephi 19.6, quoting Isaiah 9.6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of government and peace, there is no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Well, surely this must prophesy of Jesus Christ, even if this other prophecy from Isaiah 7 actually is about uh, Isaiah's own time and life period and what's going on in his life and in his world, and it's not about the future. Surely this prophecy from Isaiah 9 does have to do with Jesus Christ. Hold that thought. First thing is that this prophecy, which is very famous thanks to Handel, Handel's Messiah, is very famous. But amazingly, this prophecy is never cited in the New Testament as referring to Jesus, not even by Matthew. And you know he would if he could, if he thought he could get away with it. Also, this prophecy appears to not be a prediction at all, but a statement of something that has already happened. Past tense verbs are used throughout, though they get muddied a bit in the King James Version. Who is this son that is born, upon whose shoulders the government will be, and who will sit upon the throne of David? Many Bible scholars agree this refers to Hezekiah, the son of King Ahaz, the Davidic line. In the kingdom of Judah at Jerusalem, the kingship descends through this Davidic line, and they're very proud of that fact. So that is why scholars think it has to do with the son who is born, but this son not being Isaiah's son, but being King Ahaz's son. Hezekiah, who is the prince who will grow up to be the king. Recall that King Ahaz, the dad, was the one to whom the sign was given of a virgin conceiving in Isaiah 7.
Why does Isaiah call Hezekiah godlike names? And actually, I'm looking at this last thing. Recall King Ahaz was the one to whom the sign was given. It, was, it wasn't the, the virgin conceiving, but it was about, um, I think I mixed up my prophecies there. But it was the one that we went over where uh, it was Isaiah's son, and he went in into the prophecies, and she conceived and bore a child. I think this is the one, of course, that talks about a virgin conceiving in chapter 9 of Isaiah. So why does Isaiah then call Hezekiah the son godlike names? If he's talking about King Ahaz's son, why does he give him godlike names? Now, the NRSV, that's New Revised Standard Version, interprets this passage like this. For a child has been born for us. You see the past tense more clearly stated there. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The footnote in the NRSV says this. First, the conferring of names is reminiscent of Egyptian practice. As in many Israelite personal names, the deity, not the person named, is being described. So what this is saying is that all these wonderful names, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, that's not talking about the Son. He's being given the name, but the names are not describing the Son. They're describing the God that he's named after. Okay. So actually, uh, this is not another prophecy of Jesus either. Once again, it has to do with things that were going on in Isaiah's day. Now let's talk about the pervasiveness of Isaiah in the Book of Mormon. It is clear that the author of the Book of Mormon is intimately acquainted with the Book of Isaiah and values it highly. We have seen elements from Isaiah show up in Book of Mormon sermons, especially last week with Jacob, remember? Question, is it possible that we can see other elements from Isaiah showing up in other parts of the Book of Mormon or LDS scripture. If the author of the Book of Mormon is that intimately acquainted with Isaiah and values it that highly, it wouldn't be surprising if we found it elsewhere, would it? So I put together a few examples of this. Captain of 50, that's an interesting expression. It comes from Isaiah chapter 3, verse 3, quoted in 2 Nephi 13, 3. The captain of 50 and the honorable man and the counselor and the cunning artificer and the eloquent orator. The captain of 50. What the heck does that mean? I'm not sure. But look over here in 1 Nephi 3.31. We're talking about Laban. And after the angel had departed, Laman and Lemuel again began to murmur, saying, how is it possible that the Lord will deliver Laban into our hands? Behold, he is a mighty man, and he can command 50. Yea, even he can slay 50. Then why not us? It appears that Laban is being characterized as a captain of 50, just as it is set forth in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 3, the captain of 50. The righteous eat fruit. Isaiah 3.10, quoted in 2 Nephi 13.10, says, Say unto the righteous that it is well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. An interesting expression, isn't it? It's reminiscent of Lehi's vision of the tree of life, 1 Nephi 8.11 and it came to pass that I did go forth, this is Lehi speaking, and partake of the fruit thereof, of the tree. And I beheld that it was most sweet above all that I had ever before tasted, yea, and I beheld that the fruit thereof was white, to exceed all the whiteness that I had ever seen. So this idea of the righteous eating fruit found in Isaiah, as well as in the Book of Mormon. Now this is really going to get interesting, and I hope you'll bear with me. Jacob's allegory of the wild olive tree. In Jacob chapter 5, which is the longest chapter in the Book of Mormon, Jacob cites to an otherwise unknown prophet named Zenos and gives a lengthy and involved parable comparing Israel to a wild olive tree, and that's Zenos, Z-E-N-O-S. Otherwise unknown. Not in the Bible. Chapter 5, the summary before Jacob 5, says what it's going to be about. Jacob quotes Zenos relative to the allegory of the tame and wild olive trees, tame and wild. They are a likeness of Israel and the Gentiles. 
the scattering and gathering of Israel are prefigured. Allusions are made to the Nephites and Lamanites and all the house of Israel. The Gentiles will be grafted into Israel. Eventually, the vineyard will be burned. Okay. Why am I going into Jacob chapter 5 and this allegory? Because Isaiah also has an allegory in his writings. And he has an allegory of the vineyard. Isaiah gives a similar allegory with a similar meaning to that of Jacob. Only instead of Jacob's olive orchard, Isaiah has a vineyard of grapes. And here it is. This is found in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. It is reproduced in the Book of Mormon in 2 Nephi 15, verses 1 through 7. And this is how it goes. See if it sounds similar, if you've read Jacob's allegory. And then will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill, and he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, it brought forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and I will break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down, and I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard, here he gives the interpretation, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, which is another word for justice. And he looked for judgment and behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry. So that's Isaiah's parable of his of the vineyard. Note there's similar language in both parables, Isaiah's and Jacob's. In Isaiah 5.2, it says, And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. I just read that. Jacob chapter 5, verse 40 says, And the wild fruit of the last had overcome that part of the tree which brought forth good fruit even that the branch had withered away and died. So there's this battle going on between trying to bring forth good fruit and wild fruit, not just bad fruit, but wild fruit overtaking the good fruit, similar between both the parables or the allegories. Even the expression, what more could I have done? Isaiah 5, 4, which I just read says, what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? And in Jacob 5.41, in his parable, and it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard wept and said unto the servant, what could I have done more for my vineyard? That sounds pretty similar, doesn't it? Isaiah, what could have been done more to my vineyard? Jacob, what could I have done more? No, okay. Isaiah says, what could have been done more to my vineyard? And Jacob says, what could I have done more for my vineyard? Yeah, almost word for word. And this also, there's an expression in Isaiah. This has nothing to do now with Jacob's allegory. We're moving past that. In Isaiah chapter 6, 8, also quoted in the Book of Mormon, it says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Well, if we look at Abraham chapter 3, verse 27, we find similar language. And the Lord said, Whom shall I send? And one answered like unto the Son of Man, Here am I, send me. That's exactly the same. And another answered and said, Here am I, send me. Again, that's exactly the same as Isaiah. And the Lord said, I will send the first. So once again, we can see elements of Isaiah, not only in the Book of Mormon, but in other Latter-day Scripture, which indicates that the author of the Book of Mormon, who was obviously intimately acquainted with Isaiah and values it highly, it shows up in the Book of Mormon 
But when it shows up in other places as well, outside the Book of Mormon, it leads us to think that the same person who authored the Book of Mormon may be authoring these other passages in other texts that are considered scripture by the Latter-day Saints, including Abraham. The mouth of hell. This one's fun. Isaiah 5.14, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. And their glory, these are the glory of the wicked, and their multitude and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. D and C, 122.7, Joseph Smith is in Liberty Jail, and he writes this, And above all, if the very jaws of hell shall gape, open the mouth wide after thee. Know thou, my son, that all these things shall give thee experience and shall be for thy good. So there's this idea of hell with a mouth and jaws and opening itself to swallow people alive. Conclusion. Nephi's sermon appears to be an extended version of Jacob's earlier sermon. They both quote chapters of Isaiah and then address similar themes. Nephi's pervasive use of Isaiah is unnecessary to his sermon and appears to be largely filler. Isaiah's prophecies of Jesus are not about Jesus at all, but about contemporary events to Isaiah. We have no record outside the Book of Mormon of ancient pre-Christian Jews interpreting Isaiah to mean Jesus. In other words, there's no text out there of which I'm aware and I've done some study in the subject, uh, where pre-Christian Jews, like the Book of Mormon, they know that Isaiah is talking about Jesus, and they know all about Jesus hundreds of years before he comes. Isaiah helps them to know it. There is no record that I'm aware of, of any other pre-Christian Jews interpreting Isaiah in the same way as it's interpreted in the Book of Mormon to mean Jesus is going to come. And finally, the author of the Book of Mormon is intimately acquainted with Isaiah, and we find echoes of Isaiah at other places in LDS scripture. Okay, well, that is the end of the lesson for tonight. Thank you so much for joining me. I've had a lot of fun. Please hit like, please hit subscribe, please leave a message below, and if you can, please go to RadioFreeMormon.org and make a contribution, a donation. If you can make a small amount, a monthly recurring donation, that would be great. $5 a month, that's all I ask. If you can do more, fine. But I know times are tight, and I'm not asking for a lot. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you. I appreciate this audience, and I appreciate this opportunity to go over the Book of Mormon in the depth and detail. I think it deserves. It is a foundation scripture. It is the keystone scripture of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I have read it more than 20 times, uh, probably closer to 30, but I stopped keeping track around 20. And I've studied much of it in depth in addition to that. And I find it very fascinating. I find it a remarkable piece of literature, and I think we can learn a lot about it, and also a lot about its author or authors from a deep study of the text. So once again, thanks everybody for joining me. I look forward to seeing you next time at Radio Free Mormon Sunday School. Good night.